of the sign-in list here, I've seen a lot of familiar names from the veterans advocacy space and the veterans law side of the house, from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, from the veterans service officer community around New York State, and also a number of law students who are joining us as well from a few different campuses. This is a great mix in our virtual crowd tonight, and we look forward to the questions that you will have uh, primarily for Judge Jaquith, but also for me if, if needed, uh, to, uh, to find out some more about this fascinating field in which we work. It's an honor to be here tonight alongside someone who has devoted his entire life, literally his entire life, to public service in various forms, public service in the U.S. military, public service with the federal government as a prosecutor, public service now on the bench of the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, on which he has served since 2020. And over the course of the evening, we'll get to know him better and know about his areas of service better. But suffice it to say for now, this is someone who I, as a lawyer, kind of hope to be when I grow up, because he is someone who in so many areas of work and so many facets of his life and of the law, has found ways to do the public good and to give back to people all across the country in so many ways, many of which we will hear about this evening. So as you heard from Richard, we'll begin by a conversation between the judge and myself, and then we will have time near the end to have Q&A. So if you have questions, go ahead and throw those questions in chat. Joel will be monitoring the chat, as will I, and we'll get those questions over to the judge as well. Some of you have sent questions in advance which became part of the questions packet that we have for this evening's conversation. So those will definitely be addressed as the evening rolls on. So Judge Jaquith, thank you very much once again for being here this evening. I wanna start with what kind of resembles an opening statement, I suppose, for you. And that's kind of looking at the question of why are we all here? Why are we in this veterans law space? Why is there, in your opinion, a field of veterans law? Why do we have an entire title in the U.S. Code, an entire field of legal practice, and an entire federal court that are all devoted to ensuring that veterans and their families receive the benefits earned by virtue of their military service? Well, why is that needed? And what could happen, in your opinion, if this specialized field, and in particular your courts, did not exist? So, Judge, over to you and take it away. Thanks, Benjamin. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for the too kind introduction. Uh, let me start by saying that I'm happy to be joined uh, by my wife, uh, Rosemary Perez Jake, with and at least two of my four daughters, Amanda Loreen, and uh, I think my granddaughter, Polly Boyle, who is a 1L at Albany Law School, so she better be watching. Um, and they watch with sympathy because they have to listen to me pontificate all, all the time. But, but in their honor, I wanna note that on the last day of Women's History Month, uh, I thank them for propping me up and note that on this day in 1888 in Washington, DC, the National Council of Women of the United States was organized led by two New Yorkers, President Francis Willard and from Monroe County and Vice President Susan B. Anthony from Washington County. Uh, and uh, as an aside, I'm, I'm proud of having instigated the presidential pardon of Anthony on the centennial of the 19th Amendment because to right the wrong, she'd been convicted uh, in the Northern District of New York of illegally voting in the 1872 presidential election. So with that, as an introduction, let me jump into your question about why the field of veterans law exists. And I think it's because the rule of law is the foremost foundational principle of our nation and the service and sacrifices and suffering of veterans enabled our country's creation, preservation, its growth, its advancement and furthered the cause of freedom and representative self-government worldwide. Yet for our first 200 years, veterans depended on the good intentions and effective functioning of executive branch bureaucracies, starting with the Bureau of Prisons, uh, not prisons, Bureau of Pensions, 
excuse me, and becoming the Veterans Administration, now called the Department of Veterans Affairs, all in splendid isolation as the single federal administrative agency whose major functions were insulated from judicial review. So a veteran whose claim was denied by VA was afforded no independent review of VA decisions, no opportunity to go to court to challenge the decision of the agency, a right afforded to other citizens challenging decisions of other administrative agencies. And then with the influx of veterans post-Vietnam claims in the 70s and 80s, veterans and their advocates grew more vocal and pressing for judicial review. And in 1988, veterans prevailed and the Veterans Judicial Review Act created our court, initially known as the U.S. Court of Veterans Appeals. And in 99, the name was changed to its present U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. And that act also allowed lawyers to represent veterans and their survivors for reasonable fees in their appeal of board decisions, a new thing. And I think the righteousness and volume of the work illustrates that this specialized field and structure are necessary. Uh, the board gets about 100,000 cases a year, the Board of Veterans Appeals, and our court gets about 8,500. And uh, those cases would be lost in a, a, labor, a Byzantine abyss, if not for the structure that we have. Thank you, Judge. And, and it calls to mind, earlier this week, we celebrated Vietnam Veterans Day. Welcome home to all of the Vietnam veterans who are attending this evening's program. And at one of the online Vietnam Veterans Day events that we had, there was a Vietnam veteran who talked about his post-military service struggles in trying to get the benefits he had earned by virtue of his service. And this was a time before the changes that you talked about came into effect. And there was that time of splendid isolation where he was not able to get an attorney to take his case and go forward through these appellate channels and to try and find some way to get uh, the, really what he had earned by virtue of what he did in country in Vietnam. And so thankfully, things have changed and we're very grateful for those changes. Yeah, I think splendid isolation was an ironic term. There was nothing splendid about it. That is true. For those who are on, on the receiving end of the isolation, that certainly was not splendid at all. So I'm curious about how you became involved in this, not just this particular field of law, but law overall, because your undergraduate degree, as I recall, was in things like accounting and business administration. Where did law school come into the picture for you? Really early. Uh, when I was a kid, my interests were sports and history, but I realized pretty soon that I wasn't going to be the next uh, Johnny Unitas or Bill Russell or Kalia Strimsky and uh, look to my other interests. I love to read and particularly biographies of famous people. And I concluded that those who had shaped our nation were most often lawyers or soldiers. And a dream was born, uh, though I can't hope to equal the accomplishments of Washington and Adams or Lincoln and Grant or Roosevelt and Eisenhower, uh, they inspired me. And the loss of the gridiron and the baseball diamond uh, became our profession's gain. So we're, we're grateful for that. So 1979, uh, you received your undergraduate degree. That same year, looking at your bio, you were commissioned in the U.S. Army. What inspired Whoa. your military service? And how did you select the Army out of all the different branches out there as your branch of choice? Well, it was part history and part happenstance. Uh, you know, Washington and Hamilton, Lincoln, Grant, Roosevelt, Eisenhower were soldiers. And uh, from Lexington to Appomattox, the greatest battles of our wars were on the ground. So that was the history. And the happenstance was I saw an opportunity for a four-year Army ROTC scholarship and won one, and that enabled the son of a postal worker and a homemaker to go off to college. I'm not sure if you can see the chat here, Judge, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of comments coming in. Uh, some folks on the Army side of the house. We also have uh, Christine 
putting in go Navy, beat Army, but she helped you out with Zoom, so you have to forgive her. <laughs> so my father was a sailor. My father was a sailor, and uh, my oldest son was the director of Naval Forces Division of Cape in the Pentagon. So I'm good with the Navy. You come from a multi-branch household. That's good. <laughs> right. So we have some people on here tonight who are law students who I know are quite interested in something that was a large part of your life and your professional career, and that is the Judge Advocate General's Corps, which you were a part of from 1982 until 2011. So take us back to some highlights from those years. What are some of the memories from your time in JAG that particularly stand out to you that you can share with us this evening? My first assignment was at Fort Leonard Wood and I in Missouri, Fort Lost in the Woods, as it's known. And uh, uh, I've, if, you, if any of you watched the uh, series Ozark, I've actually been to the Lake of the Ozarks, looked at property there. Doesn't look too attractive now with the series, but uh, in any event, when I was at Fort Leonard Wood, I was thrown into legal assistance uh, uh, initially, which is sort of the general practice of law. And uh, I was, it was a three-man office, but within a few months, uh, my boss was relieved and my other, the other captain was transferred and I was by myself with paralegals seeing about uh, 20 clients a day and doing wills and separation agreements, debtor-creditor debtor, creditor matters, administrative stuff. So that was a uh, out of the box opportunity to engage in the practice of law in a very diverse environment. Then I became a trial counsel or a prosecutor, and my background had been on the defense side. I had um, gone through the trial practice course and have been certified to work in either the state's attorney's office or the public defender's office. I worked in the public defender's office, represented clients, and had a few, uh, a handful of misdemeanor trials when I was in law school. So that's what I came in with. But I became a trial counsel and uh, loved it, prosecuted some big cases, um, uh, sexual assault case involving a drill sergeant who was sentenced to 34 years imprisonment, uh, sexual harassment trial involving a major who was um, harassing his uh, four or five of his uh, female subordinates. Um, work as a brigade legal advisor, which got me involved in soldier activities. I went on a cold weather exercise to Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, just to show that lawyers can freeze too, I think. Uh, and I became a special assistant U.S. attorney, um, handling the uh, federal docket. A magistrate judge would come in once a month and I would prosecute the DWIs and that sort of thing, mostly low level petty offenses. Uh, but we also had the discovery of a, the remains of a woman uh, on post and uh, was involved in the investigation into a former Marine who worked in the commissary who was believed to have killed her and uh, accompanied the uh, supervisory assistant U.S. attorney to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington with her remains to aid in the identif their identification and cause of death. And there were jurisdictional issues. We ended up taking a manslaughter plea in the case, but it was a, uh, a very interesting work. My next assignment was at Seneca Army Depot, which was completely different. I was the sole counsel there. And so I did everything. I saw clients, I handled military justice matters, prosecuted cases, um, was a special assistant, this time in the Western District of New York, but also had 29 county claims authority and a, a breadth of administrative law responsibilities, the running of the post, uh, negotiating with the union, um, labor cases with the Merit Systems Protection Board, contracts, environmental law, uh, you name it. Uh, that was my last active duty assignment. Then I went into the reserves and did a lot of admin administrative boards in all different roles as the recorder who presents the evidence, 
the respondents council, a board member and the board lead, board president and the board legal advisor, all those roles. Um, I worked in a civil affairs battalion as a, uh, in operational law. Uh, I was the staff judge advocate for the Army National Guard at headquarters here in, in the Albany area. And then I was a trial judge from 2001 to 2010, presiding over a, nearly 100 courts martial uh, throughout the continental United States, Alaska, Germany, and uh, Korea, doing a wide variety of cases, including uh, contested uh, trials or solicitation of murder and rape and uh, you name it. So uh, that's the, I guess that's the quick thumbnail sketch of highlights. So it, it was a real boring, mundane JAG career, it sounds like. Well, the reason I'm such a big advocate for being a judge advocate is the opportunity to do so many different things without upending your life every however many months, you know, had the opportunity to have different assignments, different jobs at each duty assignment, and, and uh, the ability to have a job like I had at Sleepy Seneca Army Depot, which brought me to upstate New York, where I've been since 1985, uh, and doing all those different things. And it, and it may be that for some people, the, the path to success is law school, law firm, partnership, and stay there your entire career. Uh, but for me, I thought the best way was to learn how to be a lawyer and develop a broad based perspective that made me a more effective litigator and a more effective leader. And ultimately, I think a more effective judge. So I'm gonna ask you to put your judge's robe aside for a second and put your recruiting cap back on because we do have law students on here tonight who I know are interested in possibly pursuing a career in JAG. And so you've, you've done a great job selling JAG to them with your last two responses. Now, what words of advice do you have for them as far as what they can do in law school, what they can do in the practice of law, et cetera? What can they do to best set themselves up for success to gain entry into JAG, number one, and to succeed in the JAG Corps? Secondly, well, it's been 40 years since my own JAG application process and 37 since I interviewed students as a, an adjunct field screening officer, which I did. I would travel to Washington University in St. Louis, Southern Illinois, University of Illinois, and some other schools as an adjunct field screening officer to make accession recommendations to the Army's personnel plans and training office. But I doubt the standards have changed too much. So you know, it's what you'd expect. Strong academics, well-roundedness as shown by extracurricular activities and work or volunteer experience, leadership potential, physical fitness. You have to take a physical fitness test uh, twice a year. And there are soldier skills that are expected even of the lawyers orienteering, weapons qualification, a little bit of marching, some understanding of basic tactics and operations, uh, commitment to service, uh, an aptitude for teamwork, uh, maturity that enables you to work within a structure, those kinds of things. And I, I think to maximize your law school experience for any potential employment, you want to do as much practical work as you can do. So clinics and those kinds of things. And of course, I favor the Veterans Law Clinic uh, highly in my present position, but clinic work uh, is invaluable. And all the clinical faculty who are on tonight's webinar, thank you very much for that, uh, that, that excellent sales pitch. Great. Uh, so I wasn't prompted. I mean that sincerely. And it's born of my own experience. You know, I, the, the very best thing about my law school experience was my work in the public defender's office. That's when I knew that I had really made the right choice. The thing that I had wanted to do since I was a little kid, that along the way I thought, yeah, it, 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 you know, it hit home hard, so. 
And then looking on the other side of the council's table from your time with the public defender's office, you mentioned you while you were still serving in the Army, you became an assistant U.S. attorney. You kept on rising through those ranks, all the way up to becoming the U.S. attorney for the Northern District of New York in 2017. Why was that particular field of practice uh, so meaningful to you in the work that you were doing? Well, as I always used to tell our AUSAs, it is a great privilege and responsibility to have such a pivotal role in the legal system that is the cornerstone of our democracy and to have this as your marching order. Do the right thing in the right way for the right reason. And uh, to have the privilege of doing that work for 31 years, uh, it, you know, it's, I wouldn't have had to have done this to have been professionally satisfied, but this is, uh, you know, the icing on the cake, as it were. And I think if there's a, a mantra by which we all can live in this work, do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons might just be that mantra. So thank you for that. But it's rare to have that as your work creed, I think, and, and maybe even rarer in the practice of law because, it, you know, it's a, an adversarial system. But, uh, but, but I guess it's adaptable to every role. So. And you had that as your work creed and practice in the uniform of the U.S. Army and working for the U.S. Attorney's Office. So what was it after all those years in practice that made you say, hey, I want to become a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims? Well, I, you know, part of it was my experience. It seemed like, you know, the perfect capstone of my career, blending uh, overlapping military service and, and uh, public service in the U.S. Attorney's Office and my extensive litigation experience, trial and appellate. And practically, I was considering my mortality as, uh, as United States Attorney and uh, thought anew about what I wanted to be when I grow up, grew up uh, even though I'm an old man um, who's never grown up. I, so I looked back at the two professional loves of my life, the Army JAG and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and pondered whether there was a way to do something that involved service to our nation, securing justice, and uh, the women and men of our military who won and have preserved our republic. So I looked at the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, which handles the criminal appeals, and our court, and uh, for the practical consideration of when vacancies were expected and, and the nature of the challenge. And so CAF, as it's known, was more familiar, but no imminent vacancies. And in addition to the fact that they were arising uh, relatively soon at our court at that time, uh, there was the twist that it might be invigorating for an old man in the fourth quarter of his career to build on his administrative and civil experience from early on at Seneca and at Bonshank and King in the year that I was in private practice and in the reserves and as a young AUSA when we weren't so specialized and did both criminal and civil cases. Uh, and the prior 10 years of responsibility I'd had as first assistant U.S. attorney and the United States attorney for uh, civil cases and my participation in a leadership role as vice chair and then chair of the attorney general's uh, service members and veterans rights subcommittee. So the idea was born. I spoke to a judge on the court that had been a boss of mine in the reserves about 15 years or more before. And uh, she had no pointers for me, but uh, but uh, recommended the work. And so I reached out to the uh, representative of the White House Counsel's Office who had sat on the panel that interviewed me for the United States Attorney's job and um, recommended me to the Attorney General and uh, asked how a person might express interest in this position. And he said, you just have, send me your resume and uh, 
I interviewed uh, in the next month in Washington and in, uh, uh, that was in early 2019. And in August, uh, the president announced his intent to nominate me and an, another person to fill two vacancies on the court. And that was the start. Uh, and there was a extensive background investigation, notwithstanding all the ones of those I'd already been through uh, in between those two things. But there was still a, another year to go in the process. I won't bore you with all the details, but I got confirmed uh, by the Senate by voice vote at the end of July. And then my commissioning uh, apparently was held up as the Department of Justice had some other accession plan for my successor. And so I got sworn in uh, uh, into the court on September 2nd of 2020. And you mentioned that whole fourth quarter thing. We hope the clock in that fourth quarter is winding down very, very slowly with many <laughs> excellent years ahead on the bench or any place else you, you choose to Me go. Me too, but I'm not sure we get timeouts. So. <laughs> so I'm curious to hear a before and after picture because I imagine before you became a judge on the bench of this court. I don't have the capacity to flash one up there, but I used to have air. So. You said hair. Okay, there's a yeah. before and after picture. <laughs> In a more metaphorical sense, oh, before okay. you more joined the court, did you have any preconceptions about the court that turned out to not be exactly how the court either conducts its business or decides cases or just handles day-to-day -day operations that you discovered to be different after you joined? Well, I guess I would just say that I underappreciated it. I had a uh, you know, a general awareness of its importance. And uh, my conceptions of veterans law were really focused on my experience helping retired military members uh, and, and their families with a variety of legal problems. Uh, my concern over VA medical care and patient record keeping. I had prosecuted a case in the US Attorney's Office uh, where a, a research coordinator had falsified patient records and uh, um, a, at least one patient who, whose uh, actual laboratory results showed compromised liver and kidney functions that meant it would be very dangerous for chemotherapy to be administered to him, uh, was administered chemotherapy and the chemotherapeutic drugs killed him. Uh, as well as his supervisor who failed to, uh, the director of oncology who failed to keep tabs on this and uh, had he only looked at the actual laboratory results uh, would not have presumably uh, ordered the chemotherapy to occur. So I had that case experience. We had a lot of VA cases on the civil side in the US Attorney's Office. Um, and then my involve, in my involvement with the Service Members and Veterans Rights Subcommittee, one of our areas of focus, born of my experience, was on improved patient record keeping. So I had this relatively narrow focus and general understanding and appreciation, but it didn't take long for me to come to appreciate the complexity of the law, the preparation of the practitioners who argue cases before the court, and the, especially the diversity of thought and experience and the uniformly high intellect and judgment and the purity of purpose of my colleagues on the court and our complete staff. While the judge was responding to that question, I was doing an internet search for the, those, those pictures of the judge with hair in the before category, <laughs> but I, I couldn't find any. We'll have to go looking for those later. Uh, we'll get to these conversations about the nitty gritty of the law in a second. But first, I have a very important question to pose to the judge, because famously on the United States Supreme Court, the so-called junior justice, the newest person on the bench, has to perform certain tasks like fetching coffee for the other justices and opening the conference door room when someone knocks. I'm curious, Judge Jake, with, is there anything like that? on the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims that you had to perform when you were the newest member of the court? Well, there may still be, as I am still the junior member of the court, even though I think I'm the third oldest member. Um, 
But so far, no, not really, uh, because we've been all remote. The court has been all remote since March of 2020. And each time a return to the courthouse was planned, a spike uh, came up. And so I had been I, to the court 10 or 12 times over the first uh, 16 months of my time. And then starting with this month, we're, we're back in court uh, or back in chambers, but still with a lot of, of teleworking. And though we have had regular meetings um, as a court, none of them have been in person. So yeah, to this point. So I haven't had an opportunity to fetch coffee yet. Although that, like I said, that could be in the offing. So, but I, but I did have the privilege of judging the ugly sweater contest at both of our last two holiday parties. So I think that was, that was part of my junior judge duty. I, I think so. That's a very important role too, is to adjudicate the ugly sweater contest. Now we all have two pictures to look for one with judge Jake with, with hair and the other of the ugly sweater contest on the court. So stay tuned yeah. for coming attractions. My 21 year old son would say it's because all of my sweaters are ugly, but I did not enter in the contest. I, I, I had to recuse myself and just from, from, or at least not enter. So I wouldn't have a conflict and, and just judge, judge the contest. Right. And it's, it's always good to have a judge who recuses himself when the proper time comes. Um, so take us behind the scenes into the, the judicial conference of the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. What, what goes on behind the scenes after you've heard a case? Does the chief judge preside over every conference? Does each judge speak first with their opinions about the case and then it leads to more open discussion? How, how does it work behind the curtain? Yes, that's how it works. Uh, it, I mean, but it depends because um, we hear cases, we, obviously, well, first we hear cases as single judges. Uh, a, a, a judge screens each case that comes in, they're assigned randomly, and decides whether it is suitable for resolution by the single judge or should go to a panel of three judges. And the test has to do with uh, whether it is a, a, an a novel question of fact or law, a complicated case, a debate, a reasonably debatable outcome, things of that sort. So, uh, most of the cases are decided by single judges. If the case, and, and, and those cases do not involve oral argument, except in very unusual circumstances. Uh, if the case is, but what happens is when the draft decision is done, it goes into circulation so that for five business days, so that the other eight judges have an opportunity to read it and see if they disagree either with the outcome or with the notion that it is suitable for decision by a single judge. So either judges in their review or the screening judge, him or herself, call, can call the case to panel. And then a panel of three judges hears the case. Generally, there is oral argument in those cases. And immediately following oral argument, usually, there is a conference among the three judges. And at that conference, the senior judge, either the chief judge, if she's on the panel, uh, Margaret Bartley is our chief judge, or the senior judge, if, it's, if she's not on the panel, is the presiding judge. And that's what sets the protocol. And that it occurs as you surmised, the judges speak in order of seniority, chief judge, and then in order of seniority on the court. So I go last. Uh, and then there's discussion if that the matter's not resolved, and if it's not already apparent, a vote. And, and that's how it works when we sit on bonk, except then you have all nine judges. Now, in terms of on the record, in the oral argument itself, we have latitude. We try not to talk over each other and be deferential if a more senior judge has seems to be uh, readying to speak, but we can pretty much jump in as the spirit moves us. Is it 
a disadvantage in any way or an advantage in any way to be last to speak in the conference, so you have that order of seniority. Do you, do you like hearing the other arguments and positions of your colleagues first, or would it be better if you would give your viewpoint first to get that out on the table earlier? Oh, I think it's an advantage for me, especially as the junior judge, to hear what the others have to say first. And plus, I don't generally view it as about advocacy, so I'm, I'm just trying to take the position I think is right. And sometimes it agrees and we, you know, we listen to each other and talk things out uh, and uh, uh, sometimes can reach agreement and sometimes we can't. And if we can't, then we have opportunities to dissent in whole or in part. So. One of the great mysteries to us outsiders here is what happens when there is that disagreement because not every time does every judge agree with every other judge's position, be it on your court or any court. What happens? What, what is that situation like, or how does that tend to play out when you have disagreements with your learned colleagues on a point of law or on a particular matter dealing with the case at hand? Well, so far there haven't been any fisticuffs or, or name calling. Um, so yeah, no, we, we, we talk it out and, and then write it out in hopes that the process and our uh, collective uh, contributions to it will yield the most accurate, fair, and just result. And the exchange of ideas and draft opinions, and if there are concurrences and dissents, sharpens our work. It sometimes uh, results in compromise, but uh, almost always refines the work. And that process is enhanced by the diversity of views and backgrounds of our judges. I, I wouldn't say it's relatively rare for people to change their mind, but sometimes the writing assignment is, well, okay, write it up and then we'll, um, we'll see if I can join it or not, or if you can see your way clear to accounting for my view and uh, what have you. We went through this process in a very major way in a case that uh, uh, I fell into right upon joining the court. We had oral argument on an en banc case three weeks after I joined the court. And um, because the views were so splintered, the other new judge, Scott Lauer, and I were the tipping point for shifting majorities. And so we ended up writing the majority opinion, uh, I end up writing the part that concluded that the board committed error, and he wrote the part that uh, concluded that the error was not prejudicial, and uh, five other judges joined my part, but only me and another judge joined his, but it was still the, it still was part of the majority because the three judges that said there was no error also saw no prejudice to the veteran. And so anyway, that, that's, that's how it plays out. But the back and forth with the opinions uh, had an extraordinarily positive effect on the final product. And I, I must have read a single case 10 or 12 times. And that focus caused me to flip from thinking that it was a problem for my view of the case to concluding that it was a perfect example of why my view of the case was right. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, a significant and important process and, and a great intellectual exercise. Only problem is it takes some time. But. It, it does take time, but it sounds as if the time is absolutely worthwhile. I'm being given a note here in chat to read off the first passcode for those of you who are taking this program for CLE credit. The first passcode provided by Richard Henry of the Veterans Rights Pro Bono Project. The first passcode is Marine. And we all know which branch of service now Richard Henry uh, favors in his service. First passcode of the evening is Marine. I think that's, is that hoorah that. or hoorah? I forget. <laughs> Richard, go ahead and tell us. That is 
Hoorah, Judge. Hoorah, yeah. They're all a little different. Not much different, but a little different. And, and Tanya has given us the proper spelling of hoorah in chat, I see. Very good. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> so in talking about give and take, one of the areas that we all, I think, find fascinating when it comes to give and take in an appellate court is oral argument and the exchange that takes place between an advocate and members of the judiciary in presenting their case. And there's always kind of this mystique around oral argument of what makes a successful oral argument or what makes a less productive oral argument. During your time on the court, you have already shown yourself to be a very active questioner of attorneys appearing before you. And so I'm curious to hear from your vantage point on the bench, as well as someone who was an advocate on the other side for a few years, what makes a good oral argument? What, what are the things that advocates should try to do? And what are pitfalls that advocates should try to avoid? Well, I think the main pillar of success is preparation. But my most important point, the, the bottom line up front for you military folks, is to look to the gray. You may see the issue is clear cut, black and white, but how do you win in the gray area, I think is the question. Uh, you, and if you're really old like me, you'd now have playing in your head the Billy Joel's song as he reaches middle age, shades of gray are all that I find when I look to the enemy line. Uh, so by the time a case gets to argument, there are usually some significant debatable issues. And so wear your zealous advocate hat backwards for a moment and look at your case from the other side's perspective. Consider where your argument is the softest because you can expect questions there and probably pointed ones. And thoughtful answers to those questions can be compelling, but wrote invocation of plausible basis or veterans canon infrequently is, though, though each one has its place. And the lawyer's trick of responding to a question you don't know how to answer by saying something that you do know may uh, amuse or annoy the judge or undermine your arguments. It's not going to get you where you want to go. But preparation is, is the real key. Tell the court your client's story uh, concisely, clearly, and comprehensively, but in a few words. I mean, there's obviously some tension in those concepts, but they can be resolved with thought, time, and creativity. Uh, you know, in 1918, President Wilson reportedly said about his speeches, if it's a 10-minute speech, it takes me all of two weeks to prepare it. If it's a half-hour speech, it takes me a week. If I can talk as long as I want to, it requires no preparation at all. I'm ready now. And so it is with appellate advocacy. You have plenty of time at our court, 30 minutes aside, but rambling mush does your case no good. Uh, be candid regarding the factual and legal issues, front the unfavorable stuff, address their significance, and explain why they don't mean that you lose. Be selective in your arguments. Uh, a scatter gun doesn't often hit a specific target. And eliminate hyperbole and overstatement. Uh, save the accusations and outrage for the exceedingly rare circumstance where they are warranted. Professionalism aids in persuasion, so don't suffer by comparison to your opponent. Take the high road. That's, I think, the recipe for successful oral argument. And of course, being right is important. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, your side is always right, right? Because that, that, that's the whole reason why you're in the court. <laughs> well, but my oh. point is you have to contemplate that somebody else might see it slightly differently and see if from their perspective, you can still get to a win. So let, let's stick with this idea of shades of gray for a little while longer. One area of the veterans law realm where there, there seems to be a lot of shades of gray back and forth uh, deals with this whole legacy, and this can go way back in the congressional history, of the VA being a proclaimant non-adversarial system. This is the bedrock of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and 
for a long time, we had veterans themselves, as you alluded to earlier, actually resisting the introduction of lawyers into this field of splendid isolation in veterans law, uh, with veterans themselves saying, this will be like the fox hanging around the chicken coop. This will be adversarial beings coming into this purportedly non-adversarial process. So for your court, what is the role of the Court of Appeals of Veterans, of Veterans Claims in safeguarding this ideal of a proclaimant non-adversarial system, even though the cases that come before your court are, by definition, adversarial proceedings? Yes, well, before, before I tackle that directly, let me address briefly the premise of the question. And it, it summarizes the situation correctly. And uh, not so long ago, just before the creation of our court, the Supreme Court uh, even observed that, that uh, um, injecting attorneys into the process undercut the non-adversarial nature of the thing and veterans didn't really need counsel's assistance. And uh, if they had lawyers, it might make that the custom and they'd lose part of their award to have to pay the lawyers and, 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 that's, and that sort of thing. But more recently, some luminaries in veterans law have expressed a different perspective on that point. Um, before joining the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, Judge Allen suggested that greater involvement by lawyers in the claims process could uh, reduce delays by bringing their legal training to bear to ensure that available evidence was assembled and presented to meet the elements of the claim at the initial adjudication. Because as you know, uh, Benjamin, one of the things that slows the process down is the number of remands back from the board to the regional office or from our court to the board and sometimes again to the regional office. It causes the average legacy appeal time, I think, is now about five and a half years. And so that's a, a big reason for it. So uh, uh, and, and uh, in 2018, our then Chief Judge uh, Davis suggested also that lawyers are needed at the administrative level to help avoid problems with decisions coming out of regional offices. And now the department itself, VA itself, publicly notes that veterans may want an accredited attorney or veteran service officer to help them understand and apply for benefits, help them gather supporting documentation, documentation file a claim on their, uh, maybe file the claim on their behalf. And all that accords with my experience that having the advice, assistance, and advocacy of a lawyer nearly always sharpens the identification and presentation of the relevant facts and applicable law. And that hastens resolution and increases the likelihood of an appropriate income uh, outcome. Well, and appropriate income too. <laughs> um, but aside from that, uh, our court does have a role in, in uh, addressing the and really preserving the non-adversarial nature of the process in other ways. Uh, a major one of those is to review and resolve issues regarding VA's fulfillment of its duty, its affirmative duty to make reasonable efforts to assist claimants in developing the facts pertinent to their claim. And that sometimes requires them to uh, have a VA medical examination and opinion done where it's necessary to make a decision. Uh, it includes gathering service records, service treatment records, including from uh, the Veterans Choice Program or any, uh, whether it's in the VA or not, if, if, they've, if they've paid for it, they, they should be able to get the records for the veteran. Uh, and, and service records, especially when this service member alleges having served in an area where there might have been herbicide exposure, Agent Orange cases, uh, contaminated water at Camp Lejeune, hoorah, uh, or uh, uh, the, the duty to, res 
to assist is not unlimited. It's restricted to uh, uh, specifically identified documents that by their description are facially relevant and material, but it's, it's a may help test, not it's dispositive. So that's one thing, the duty to assist. The second thing is a sympathetic reading of the veterans claims. The, the government's interest in veterans cases is that justice be done. And so uh, the systemic fairness that's essential to securing justice includes a duty to construe veterans submission sympathetically, especially if the veteran is self-represented or has a non-attorney non representative, but even if the veteran has a, an attorney representative, a licensed attorney. So this includes liberally construing filings to determine potential claims raised by the evidence, uh, applying all laws and regulations that uh, appear relevant to potential causes of the veteran's condition and theories of service connection that are reasonably raised by a sympathetic reading of the claimant's filing, not just what they narrowly have specified on a document. Uh, the third thing I'd cite is that to adequately explain their reasons or bases for findings and conclusions that are adverse to a veteran, the board has to analyze the credibility and probative value of all material evidence submitted by or on behalf of the veteran or reasonably raised by the record, uh, has to account for the evidence it finds persuasive or unpersuasive, discuss all provisions of law or regulation where they're potentially applicable because of assertions made or issues that are raised by the record and provide reasons for rejecting material evidence that's favorable to the claimant. Uh, the, what am I up to? The fourth obligation we review for that VA has is its duty to maximize, to help the veteran maximize benefits. Uh, so that requires them to assess all of his claimed, uh, all of his disabilities to determine whether any combination of them establishes entitlement to disability compensation. And then last, but certainly not least, it is to apply the longstanding pro-veteran canon that provisions for benefits to members of the armed forces are to be construed in the beneficiary's favor. And that remains kind of a hot topic that I recently wrote extensively on because of the uncertainty, or if there is certainty, it's on a slippery ground, I guess I would say, of whether that pro-veterans canon applies at step one of statutory construction or step two, only after you've concluded that the facial language is ambiguous. I'll stop there on that possibly expansive subject. Would you mind speaking a little bit more on your recent writing on that subject and, and where you fall on that, that sort of two-step question? Well, I, I'm concerned, let's put it this way, I'm concerned that the the uh, focus on the veteran, the pro-veteran canon as arising only on a finding of ambiguity first uh, is, a, is a misread of the Supreme Court cases in this area and focuses unduly on a single line from the Gardner case. And it sometimes is called the Gardner canon, but that's not really the origin of it or perhaps even the best, best exposition of it. And of course, then you have the issue of whether uh, uh, of ambiguity or the conclusive nature of the language and its clarity is somewhat in the eye of the beholder. So we have big arguments about what the language clearly means, uh, interestingly enough. And so the dispute rages. Uh, the, the Supreme Court did not address the issue in the Kaiser case, unfortunately. Um, the Federal Circuit has addressed the issue and come down on the side of uh, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, that is, that reviews our cases, come down on the side of um, the pro-veteran canon only being applied at step two if there's an ambiguity. 
but over some fairly vigorous and and uh, dissents that make some good points. And in the case that I was dissenting in, it had to do with whether the special, the plain language of the special monthly compensation statute permitted uh, a half step increase and a full step increase or just a half step increase, depending on the number and seriousness of the veterans disabilities. And a majority of my, two of my colleagues said only one intermediate step and I saw in the statutory language, intermediate step or next higher statutory step. And to me, that meant they could get two steps. And so Thank you. Thank you. that caused me to also launch into the, that their reading being inconsistent with the duty to maximize benefits and the pro-veteran canon. And I'm really glad that that you and the court overall is paying a lot of attention to that issue. I think I speak for a lot of us in the veterans law space that in the wake of the Kaiser decision in particular, there's been a lot of attention being paid at long last, I think, kind of overdue to this question of administrative deference and what exactly does it mean? What should it not mean? How far should it extend? And how far should it not extend when it comes to an agency, in this case, the VA, and their ability to say, oh yeah, we wrote this using this language, but we think this language means X, even though a reading of that language might lead a reasonable observer to say, no, it means Y. So I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing the various trajectories that uh, your court goes in, in the immediate future on, on this issue. Me too. So another topic of interest among all of us who who toil in the veterans law vineyards is that of records, because many of us, probably all of us who work in this space have had at least one disability compensation case and perhaps many where you go into the veterans background and the service treatment records of the US military do not contain detailed notes. In fact, sometimes there are no notes at all uh, for the in-service injury or illness that the veteran is asserting. So in such situations, what are some ways from your vantage point that a veteran can successfully prove their case? Uh, what other kinds of evidence can the VA and your court consider in such situations? Well, as you point out, Benjamin, what is in the veterans service treatment records is almost always an issue since obviously service connection requires in-service injury or aggravation, generally speaking. But it's impermissible for the board to require that, kind, require that kind of contemporaneous medical evidence as a prerequisite to considering lay evidence by the veteran, his uh, uh, fellow soldiers, sailors, uh, flyers, or Marines, uh, or spouse or friends, that kind of lay evidence credible. And the board can't consider the absence of that kind of evidence as substantive negative evidence without first establishing a proper foundation for drawing an adverse inference from the absence, such as uh, because a contemporaneous report would ordinarily occur, something like a medical opinion that the injury alleged was so serious that if the veteran had actually suffered it in service, it would have to have been reported. Uh, in addition, uh, lay evidence, you know, meaning you know, evidence from the veteran and others, such as fellow soldiers, as I've mentioned, must be considered by the board and, and the court in determining service connection. And it may be competent to prove the existence of a disability without confirmatory medical records. It, it, it comes down to a question of competence and uh, credibility. In, in general, as you logically might conclude, a lay person is not capable of rendering a medical opinion or uh, rendering an opinion on a matter that requires medical knowledge. But lay statements by a veteran and others are competent to relate things that they've experienced and observed. Observe, observe 
observable symptoms, for, for example. And, and that can provide sufficient evidence of service connection, depending on what the evidence is. So believable testimony about the onset of symptoms while on active duty may be enough, depending on what the evidence is. But it's the board's job to weigh the evidence and it's reviewable by our court only for clear error. So how does this work? For, for example, a veteran can testify that he awakened himself with loud snoring and experienced sleep that wasn't restful and sleepwalked and uh, fell asleep during the day and call his roommate to say, yeah, he was snoring really loudly, getting up in the middle of the night, waking up screaming. They can say all that and that may carry the day. But what they can't say was that the veteran had obstructive sleep apnea. Not too many uh, veterans are, have the medical training to uh, uh, reach that conclusion. So as that story should illustrate, the, the advocacy tips are to establish as strong a written, written record as you can by gathering records, identifying records you think ought to be there so that this duty to assist will kick in in a more effective way uh, and they will, they'll have a heightened responsibility to, to look. Um, uh, you want to see if you have lay observation of symptoms by the veteran, uh, her or himself or these other possibilities, fellow military members, friends, family, uh, private medical opinions, whatever there is to support the veteran's claim. And if the veteran asks for a hearing, ensure that you and the veteran are prepared and address uh, this, this issue, which may be the elephant in the room. Uh, the board member may just ask the veteran to describe his situation, ask no further questions, thank the veteran for his service, and say, I'll look carefully at this and see what I can do. And then find that the veteran's account is not credible because a lot of time has passed or because there's no corroboration and a VA compensation and pension examiner uh, says the origin of the problem is more recent, such as the product of aging. A lot of veteran claimants look like this, not like one of you. So you go to a hearing understanding that the veteran's credibility is at issue, even if nobody says so, and attempt to present a case that shows why the veteran should be believed. And uh, from what I've seen, hearings are often underutilized and are missed opportunities. Thank you. And continuing down this road of advocacy pointers, we have a number of veteran service officers who are with us tonight. And they handle initial claims all the way through appeals to the Board of Veterans Appeals in the course of their veteran service officer practice. So I'm interested in some advice from you to them. What advice would you give to them regarding setting up a client for success if an appeal to your court proves to be necessary in the future? In other words, what can you do as an advocate at the administrative levels of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to establish a strong record that would improve the client's possibilities for a better outcome if an appeal to your court does become necessary down the road? Well, it, it includes all those things that I just described. Um, gathering up, uh, one, take uh, the, the threshold is take seriously your obligation or your need to look after yourself. The veteran needs to do that and the VSO needs to do that. And if it gets to a point in time where there's an attorney, the attorney needs to do that, to look out for the veteran. Understanding that it is a pro-veteran, pro-claimant system, but that has its limits and there's no better advocate for the veteran as in all walks of life than the person them, themselves. And so that means gathering records, 
asking for help in gathering records, pushing for medical examination. If possible, if, if that's not working, then trying to get a, a private medical examination that might, might help and taking very seriously the importance of making a good record on paper and in hearing testimony. It, it, asking for a hearing takes more time. I mean, there are various options available. Virtual hearings are very prevalent now and those involve the least amount of delay. Uh, you can go to a, a VA regional office and connect up to a, uh, a board member or veterans law judge from there. You can go to the board in Washington, DC and do it. And sometimes, although they're not presently doing this, a, a board member will come to a regional office. But the fastest way to get a hearing is like this or by telephone. But however it occurs, keep in mind the things that we've talked about, the importance of the onus, the VA has an obligation and the presiding veterans law judge or board member has an obligation to try to flesh out the issues, but nobody does that better or knows the case better than the veteran herself and the veterans representative. And so these hearings where the board member says, um, here's what I've got, what else would you like me to know? Thank you for your service. Or a, a representative who says, um, Colonel Jakewith, what would you like to tell the veterans law judge about your injuries? That's not taking maximum advantage of the opportunity to make the case, which as I said, you have to do with the understanding that it is going to be examined critically. And you understand why it's not meanness, I mean, as in every uh, endeavor, there are going to be some people who are trying to take advantage. You know, somebody like me who says, you know, I'm pretty sure it was my active service that caused my hair to fall out. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you know, that happens, it happens. But, so they have a responsibility to be good stewards of, of taxpayer dollars uh, and they have a, large caseload, 100,000 cases, 100,000 board cases a year, and uh, tens of thousands of hearings. So take the bull by the horns, so to speak, and uh, uh, make the best presentation possible with the understanding that it's a proclaiming system, but you should look out for yourself and at least impose on yourself a, the burden of demonstrating that this injury occurred in or was aggravated by service. Or that the Important rating that you've the gotten is inadequate or whatever the, whatever the uh, 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 issue on appeal is. Thank you, that, that's extremely helpful. And I think words that we can all take back and build upon in our various areas of advocacy. So thank you for that. I wanna make certain that we get to the different questions that have been sent my way here in chat. There's some wonderful questions and we'll get to as many as we have time for this evening. So the first one we have is a question about compensation and pension exams. Uh, when it comes to a VA C&P, compensation and pension examination, how does the court view those? Does the court scrutinize the quality of the exam and or the expertise of the examiner, or is the examiner presumed by your court to be competent and sufficient to give the opinions that they're given about the veteran's medical condition, its severity, and its service connection or lack thereof? Well, we look at the circumstances the, in determining how much uh, well, excuse me, we don't, we don't determine how much weight to give to the opinion. That's 
that's really that's done by the board. So we review that determination, though, and we look at all the circumstances that rarely involves very much information, if any, about the background qualifications and that sort of thing of the examiner, whether it's a CMP examiner or uh, uh, a more specialized person. Usually the only information that appears in the record is the person's title. Sometimes it says it's a nurse practitioner, it's a physician's assistant, it's uh, uh, a physician, a specialist, it may say audiologist or endocrinologist or cardiologist or whatever it might be. Um, so that's pretty much the, the limits of the information that we get. Not that that couldn't be part of the record, but again, if that's a concern, uh, if that's a veteran's concern, or if uh, a, a VA lawyer sees this as a weak spot, there's, you know, there's opportunity there to make a record regarding the qualifications of the examiner. But normally what happens is the determination of whether the examination and opinion are adequate uh, is based on what the examiner says. Um, does he set, does he or she set forth a cogent, well-reasoned rationale for the opinion? What's the opinion based on? Uh, what, what facts and circumstances were considered? Do they include medical records? Uh, what level of familiarity with the case and level of expertise can be discerned from the examination report. So we have to look at the record circumstances in deciding whether the board's reliance on that medical opinion was uh, um, erroneous, clearly erroneous, or not, or if whether it was clearly erroneous or not, if it was not adequately explained by an inadequate reasons or basis for relying on the opinion were set forth by the board. Uh, sometimes there's a disconnect. You know, uh, we, I, I have a case right now, whether they were supposed to examine uh, a person for a right ankle disability and they um, examined him for a left ankle disability and concluded that his ankle disability wasn't service connected. That's a problem, as you might imagine. It's not always that obvious though. So, uh, uh, but we look at all the circumstances. That's, that, that's what our case law uh, requires us to do. Thank you. Uh, next question we have here is a question about timing. Approximately how old is a court of appeals for veterans claims appeal? Um, uh, I'm not, I don't have the, the stats at my fingertips, but I guess it depends on what you mean by that. Uh, as I said, I think the legacy appeals from beginning to end, and I think that might just mean out of the board are, uh, five and a half years, uh, in duration or 2015 days, I think sticks in my mind. Um, the hope is that the uh, Veterans Appeals Improvement and Modernization Act, known as AMA, or just the Appeals Modernization Act, will change that with its three options of review. And I think the early returns suggest that it might. The, the, uh, that's the, the advantage of the options is they can be faster. Um, how long it takes at our core? I think varies, and we're constantly trying to improve. Single judge decisions are faster than panel decisions, which are faster than uh, en banc decisions. So uh, I think it ranges from a few months to uh, a year or two, depending on the nature of the case and process. Thank you. Our next question here looks at clerkships. Uh, it says a clerk that has been assigned to a judge, does he or she research both sides of the case? Or does the judge ask for the clerk to research one side 
and does that process vary between judges? Each judge has their own system, I think. Uh, I did have these kind of meetings with all of my colleagues when I joined the court to learn what I could uh, about what other judges do. And I think most of the judges, and this is what I do, uh, assign, or, or they're actually just assigned by my confidential assistant or through my confidential assistant in rotation to one of four, I have four law, each of the judges has four law clerks, a uh, senior clerk and three other clerks. And uh, they get assigned the case without any pre-screening uh, or foreordained outcome from me. I think there is one judge maybe who reads the cases initially and gives some indication of where they think they are, but I don't do that. And I think most of the judges don't. So uh, we get a, a clean read, so to speak, from our law clerks on what they think the uh, right outcome is based on the evidence in the law and set about reviewing the case. I, I think each individual's practice is a little bit different, but it for everybody includes reading all the papers. Uh, you know, the appellant's brief, the secretary's brief, the appellant's reply brief, if there is one, the board decision, and uh, going through the record. And it's a, it's a rigorous process. And then once a draft is done, there's a peer review process where other clerks critique it. And then I get it and I go through it. And that takes me a few hours to a few weeks, depending on how much um, reworking I do. And once, once in a while, but not often, I uh, undo the whole thing. We, I disagree with the suggested outcome. More often they get it, the, their preliminary sense of it is, is good in my judgment. Uh, it just needs more attention to the record, the law or whatever, which I then undertake to do generally. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty hands-on. Uh, very hands-on. I don't really have a good sense of how much the other judges are, but uh, that's sort of how the process works. And it definitely involves, uh, you, you know, considering both sides. I'm very, as, as your characterization of my conduct at oral arguments might suggest, I am very interested in what the parties have to say about the case and in testing that. One thing we've all noticed from afar by, by watching the courts in recent times is there is no such thing as a lukewarm bench when Judge Jakewith is sitting on the panel, which I think is a very good thing because it gets the information out. So I, I certainly appreciate that watching the oral arguments from afar. Uh, next question we have here says, I have a client who is located at Rikers Island in New York City, and I have tried everything to get his comp and 10 done before the trial. Uh, but the contract examiners have done everything to prolong his case prior to his trial. This is a decorated veteran. What do I do now? How do I further advocate for him? Judge, any, any thoughts that you might want to share on that scenario? Well, I, I, my advice is keep at it. Uh, I recently had a case. I decided uh, a single judge memorandum decision, so it's not precedential, and I don't remember the name of it. But where this issue came up, and there's no, you know, there's no exclusion for making reasonable efforts to conduct an examination if one is warranted, because the veteran is in custody. So uh, there has to be a showing made uh, in, in terms of uh, whether reasonable efforts to accomplish it have been undertaken and are impossible uh, or can't have been unable to succeed. It's not enough to run out the clock as it were. So uh, I, I think the law is in your favor to, to at least the point of uh, forcing a reasonable effort and reasonable decision on the request. Assuming that uh, 
an examination is necessary applying the McClendon factors. Thank you. So looking at the time, I want to pose one more question to you, Judge, and then we'll, we'll wrap up uh, for the evening. And the question that I, I have to conclude our night asks you to kind of take out the crystal ball a little bit. And looking at since you joined the court, uh, coming up on, what, a, a year and a half now or so, what do you feel are the most significant shifts in the veterans law realm that you have observed and been a part of? And what do you believe will be the impacts of those shifts in the years to come? Lastly, last part of the compound question is where do you think the field is going next? What do you feel are the next momentous shifts that are likely to take place within this field of practice? Uh, it's hard to see beyond what's happening now and because it is so momentous. You don't need a crystal ball to see that there's a momentous shift going on. Uh, we're starting to reckon, reckon with the AMA, uh, which was enacted in August of 2017, became effective in February of 2019, and is now starting to uh, get to us. And it significantly changed the process for resolving uh, disputes with VA claims decisions uh, with this three-lane process. And, and I, uh, just to illustrate, I know, I know we're short on time. I won't launch into an exposition of it too much, but to illustrate, I have, I had an oral argument on Tuesday involving the issue of uh, whether the um, notice letter that the board sent to a veteran that his, his uh, appeal could not be processed because it was untimely, constituted a decision that was appealable to our court that we had jurisdiction to address, or as the secretary asserts, was just a preliminary notice and the appeal is to the board, even though it was the board that sent the notice letter, uh, to make a more formal determination of whether uh, to act on the appeal, and then, and only then, is that decision appealable to our court. So we just had oral argument on that case on Tuesday. My next oral argument is April 14th at the University of Florida College of Law, Go Gators, and it concerns another uh, AMA issue, and that is, does the former requirement that the same board member or veterans law judge who conducts a hearing has to decide your case survive the AMA. The specific statutory provision that said that no longer appears. The veteran argues that it's implied from any other statutory provision. And then there's the issue of uh, a case that we decided in 2011, Arneson, that didn't squarely decide fair, a fair process principle in similar circumstances. That is the changing of judges between hearing and decision, but decided under the facts of that case, not only that changing judges was not okay and that accorded with the prior statute, but also that it was, it deprived the veteran of a meaningful opportunity to be heard to have his and his wife's credibility determination uh, or measured by one judge who heard and then a decision made by another judge who didn't have any exposure to that. So that's the circumstance in this case. There were actually three hearings involving different uh, VLJs. And so whether that was is proper under the AMA We'll find out. So those are just two, and there are there are issues with notice requirements and and uh, the the efforts to streamline things have some consequences, some of which may be unintended. Anyway, it'll be a while. We'll be a while working these things out. I think it's fair to say. So that's one thing. 
another thing I think you should keep your eye on is the law pertaining to uh, uh, motions alleging clear and unmistakable error. And that was the subject of the case I described, the en banc case, Percy Valley is the name of the case. And that case is on appeal uh, to the Court of Appeals for Federal Circuit after a very fractured decision. And this, the central issue in the case had to do with, uh, as you probably know, review for clear and unmistakable error in a prior decision has to be based on the evidentiary record and the law at the time the decision was made, because these are final decisions that were not appealed. So it's undoing finality. You know, you have an opportunity to appeal, you don't exercise that, you bear a very high burden to later upset the apple cart. But you can, if you can show clear and unmistakable error on the facts and the law at that time. So the question arises when the law changes, you can't apply that law retroact retroactively, right? That would fly in the face of the principle I just expressed. But that doesn't, in my view at least, and I so wrote, that doesn't bar you from later after the law has changed, making a Q motion and having that motion judged against the law at the time, which might be the same, and it might not be. The fact that a later entity has said the law is now what, what it always has been, you can't rely on that case, but if the law is as it always has been, you should be able to rely on that. So that was my view. Five of my colleagues agreed, three did not. It's on appeal to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. But more importantly, a Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit case, review of a prior case of ours, that uh, is a Q case based on a change in the law with a, this change in the law issue. George, the Supreme Court granted cert on this year. And it looks like they're going to hear the case. So stay tuned. The law of Q motions may change uh, uh, dramatically. Um, one other thing I would mention, and I won't spend too much time on, is that last year our court decided a case called Baudet, uh, having to do with VA's caregiver program for uh, uh, severely disabled combat veterans compensating uh, people that have to provide them in-home care. And VA argued that that, the, the, that was a medical question that was not subject to board and judicial review. Our court disagreed and so ruled. And uh, VA has indicated that that's gonna result in 40,000 more board decisions this year and more than 50,000 next year. So stay tuned for that. And it was also uh, another in an increasing number of class action cases, which is another paradigm shift for our court. And in Baudet, they found that the class requirements were met relatively recently within the last year, maybe even the last six months, the last year at least. We have enacted rules governing class actions and they mirror pretty much the class action rules that practitioners would be familiar with and focus on numerosity, commonality, typicality, adequacy of representation, official action, and superiority in the context of veterans' cases. And uh, I have two class action cases pending too. So I think those four areas are, uh, are the cutting edge right now, and we'll see what happens next. Maybe the, the uh, uh, attorney representation question will uh, spread uh, beyond the progress that it's made in the development of uh, judicial review of veterans cases. A lot to watch for sure. I know many of us will be watching those oral arguments coming up with a lot of interest. Uh, Baudet in particular, there's a lot of caregivers here in New York State who are watching the aftermath of Baudet and what the VA does next with respect to the caregiver program with a ton of interest because they have a lot of things, including financial stipends, including access to medical insurance and respite care, et cetera, 
hanging in the balance of what comes next. And so it just shows the real world impacts, day to day impacts in the lives of veterans and their families that occur as a result of, of what this court does. And we're so grateful to have heard from Judge Jake with this evening about some insights, many insights into the work of that court and just how that court carries out its mission. This is the time of the night when if we were sitting together in Albany Law School, we would all stand up and give Judge Jake with a standing ovation for his time tonight and for the work that he does every day. We can't quite do that on Zoom, but Judge, just please know, virtually speaking, we are all virtually standing up and applauding in thanks and in gratitude for your insights and candor tonight and the work that you're doing every day on the Court of Appeals to Veterans Claims with your colleagues uh, for veterans and military families, not just in New York State, but across all of the states and territories over which you have jurisdiction. So thank you very much for this evening and thank you for what you do every day. Thanks very much. It's there, a are, there are two more important ministerial tasks before we close tonight. The first is to provide you with the CLE code that you have to enter for those who are taking CLE credits. CLE passcode number two of the evening is veterans. CLE passcode number two is veterans. But don't leave yet because you want to, to both hear and see the second item that we have to show you before we adjourn. This was provided to me during the presentation, courtesy of someone whom Judge Jacob knows, and that is uh, Beth Kubala from the Syracuse University College of Law. Uh, the judge alluded this evening to some pictures out there uh, in the realm of incriminating evidence. And so I'm gonna share with you on the screen uh, the, the gift that was provided to me by Beth Kubala, Professor Kubala, of the Syracuse University College of Law. The person on the right and the person on the left are, I understand, the same individual who is our featured speaker this evening. Yeah, that's a picture of me in law school. So, I, you know, the, pra the practice of law can be hard on a person. But still worthwhile, right? <laughs> Definitely worthwhile. But, you know, you have to take the bad with the good. So, on that note, Thank you all very much for your attendance this evening. Thank you for the work that all of you who are here tonight, who are the advocates of today, do for veterans and their families every day. And thank you to all of the law students who are here this evening for the advocacy that we know you're gonna be doing in the years to come on behalf of those who have served in our military and their families. And one last thank you to Judge Jakewith for his time tonight and for his insight. Lastly, but not least, a big thanks to our hosts this evening, to Richard Henry and to Joel Barron of Albany Law School's Veterans Rights Pro Bono Project. It was a little over 10 years ago that I founded that project as a student at Albany Law School. And here we are 10 years later, welcoming as a guest of this project and a guest of Albany Law School, a sitting judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals to Veterans Claims. And it truly is an honor to be in his presence and to hear from him in his insights into the law and practice of this work. So with that, I will turn the mic back over to Richard to close us out. Thank you very much. And Richard, back over to you. I don't know if I have anything more to add that Benjamin didn't say. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, I'll just close the loop here. If anyone attending for CLE credits has any questions, uh, please email our CLE coordinator, uh, Lisa Rivage at L-R-I-V-A at albanylaw.edu. Um, and once again, the two passcodes for CLE credits tonight were Marine and Veterans, if you missed those. Um, thank you, Judge Jaquith and Benjamin for agreeing to be the panelist for tonight. Um, look forward to maybe having you back one day. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you for your service.